1992 Landers earthquake in California was uh, 97.3, and we want our interest in the original form. So what did the fault start look immediately, like immediately after the earthquake? And then how, how was, did it change, the initial changes of the fault start by erosion and also by people walking over them? So I'll review the events. Then I'll describe the original forms and show a little bit of the rupture mapping just to give a sense of te the technique. And then I'll, I'll describe our monitoring of the e evolving system. So it's been more than 20 years since the earthquake. So here was the earthquake that occurred in this part of California. So it's on the eastern side of the San Andreas fault system. And so it's not on the main San Andreas, but a secondary fault zone. Maybe has a little slip rate, but it's uh, less than a few millimeters per year. So these earthquakes are not very common, maybe every 10,000 years, but when they occur, uh, they're significant. The other thing that was important about the earthquake was that it was, say, uh, it broke across several segments. So I made a, it made a joke about this before that it, the, there was, there's a fault here called Johnson Valley Fault, Homestead Valley Fault, Emerson Fault, Camp Rock Fault. So all these different faults have been mapped by the geologists. And so initially we might have said, oh yeah, it's only going to break on one fault. But instead it broke from one to the next to the next. So it wasn't obeying the rules that you should stay on the same name of fault. So uh, this is, the main point is with the pretty segmented rupture, it, it broke these different fault surfaces, but it was big, at 80 kilometers of rupture length and peak offsets of as much as five meters. So one place we studied mostly was up here. This is the area of the peak slip on this Emerson Fault, and it's a very beautiful zone of rupture right on the side of this, this hill. So you can see the little fold, so it's a kind of a plunging fold right there, and uh, it's the right lateral fault, so you can see this bend in the fault, and you see these layers here are dipping away from the uh, the bend there. So it's kind of like the bend is like this, the material comes in, it hits the bend, and it, it has to lift up as it moves against the bend. And so that's the geologic story of this place. So we know there's been significant deformation there. This side has is mostly like a granite, and this side is sedimentary deposit. So the softer sedimentary units are pushed against the bend and they're deformed over geologic time. But in the earthquake, just one event, it ruptured right along the side here, same as where there had been prior earthquakes apparently based on limited uh, evidence from all start. So these air photos were part of the response to the earthquake. They were taken two days after. So the U.S. Geological Survey has an arrangement to immediately contact aerial photography companies and they talk to the scientists and the scientists say, here's the plan, go. And so they take high quality air photos right over the fault zone. This is 20 years ago. Now we would take high quality air photos and probably LIDAR everywhere on those faults. So the initial response always has uh, uh, remote sensing. So here's just some pictures of the ground cracking. You can see the the cracks across the road. You see this, this some opening here because of this right step. So uh, here's some more cracking. Some some vertical. You see this place had a little bit of vertical. So because of the complexity of the rupture, we saw more than just right lateral offset. There were places with small thrust faults, even though the overall behavior was right lateral rupture. So this is a, a paper that was, uh, this is a student of Carrie C., uh, Sally McGill, and Charlie Rubin, another uh, colleague. They were there and mapped the rupture very carefully along with many other scientists. And this is a really nice paper, so it took seven years for it to be written. But uh, they documented the rupture very carefully in the, especially that area where I was just talking to Emerson's fault. So I made a little video just to to look at their their uh, map, just so we can see. So here's Google Earth. I put the map in Google Earth just so you can see the slide. Right. You can see where the earthquake was out here in this place called the Mojave Desert. 
So here's the map from their their work. It's uh, about several, maybe six or seven kilometers long. That's the length scale. So let's just zoom in. So you can see the rupture mapping, very nice mapping. The main trace is here, uh, right in this area, but there was some secondary cracking fairly far away. So we go past this hill, the place I was just talking about. You see the band there. These secondary faults on the sides, which were not having significant offset, but noticeable. See this very pretty small uh, step over here, which they provide some detail for. More mapping of the cracking. Another detailed area. Zoom of the details of the cracking. And this area here, this this uh, lake bed was a place where there was some trenching done, and I'll, I'll describe that, where they tried to figure out when the prior earthquake was. So here you can see more. Just the detail of the mapping, my main point is to just see what you would do after you did all the mapping and all the description. You just make a very detailed map. The other thing you can see, remember my discussion uh, the philosophical point that these faults can be say, can be discontinuous. You don't have to draw a line straight through everything. You can see they start and stop, and and that is more realistic to what we see. So these numbers are places where they made offset observations. So they had a a table with a description of the rupture at each one of those numbers. So here's this place I I refer to, and I'll show. This is where we studied in detail this. Uh, this scarp along the side of this fold, and it was because it had a bit of vertical, it kind of had one to two meters vertical as well as five meters horizontal there. They were mostly mapping on the air photos. Nowadays, you know, 92 is not so much GPS. Now you might do uh, differential GPS along the crack. It's quite tedious, so this is where you may have a big team, as I said before, to go and, okay, guys, you know, let's go, you do these, you do these, let's do it all the same way. So this place here, so I'm going to show more from here. But you just can see there was some secondary fault and little reverse faults. These were actually getting parallel. So the, the, the layers are dipping away from the fault right in here. So they're striking to the northwest, dipping northeast, and these thrust faults were on bedding. Uh, as kind of accommodating the shortening because of this really big bend right here in the fall. Okay? So the next thing we did is survey activity. So this is a table showing dates starting in 1992, right after the earthquake, until 2009. And then this is uh, what we did. And so observations and photography, mapping, Benchmarks, ground stereo photography, uh, profiling of different features, surveying. And so one thing, so this is OTS means optical total station. So we did traditional topographic survey with a uh, total station survey instrument. So you can see over time that the bottom line here is total points surveyed, 375 points in the topography maybe 1,000, 1,600, 9 million, <laughs> because we use a terrestrial laser scanner. So you see the evolution of the technology before somebody, you know, I'm pushing a button, someone's moving around, we're measuring the, the scarf, but it's very slow. Whereas now with the, the, the TLS, we can get, you know, 1,000 points per second. So in one or two seconds, with the modern system, we can do what would take two days in the old way. So this is not to say that the, uh, the old surveys are bad or that the total station is not useful because it's very deliberate. You make a selection of what you're going to study, whereas with the TLS, you just blast everything and you hopefully find what you're looking for in the data. So that, so that was what we did in uh, 2008. 2009, we took some pictures. And then in 2012, we actually went back and uh, I showed you already the structure from motion survey. We flew the balloon over the site. So over 20 years, we kept studying the erosion. And uh, uh, I have still to write a paper about all of this. But 
here I can show you some changes. So here's the, I showed this yesterday, but the lower left is the terrestrial laser scan. So that's the topographic map made with the 9.5 million points. So it's, it's very detailed. You can see this is a truck here for scale. So we parked there. And you, but the thing is all this white in the TLS survey is shadowy because you couldn't see, you know, we were shooting like this. So you sometimes can't see behind the hill with the laser. Then this one is the 2012 structure from motion. So we, I'll show more in a moment, but we flew the balloon along the fault zone. And so it's vertical imaging, same scale. You see we parked about the same place. There's a truck again. So the structure from motion can be quite useful also. It's not as detailed as the TLS survey by Kriegel. So here's a, this is a movie, another movie with, uh, I'm using the, we made an ortho photograph, uh, which is the mosaic of the balloon photo. So this is the coverage of all of the, we, there's about a thousand photographs from the balloon mounted camera. So we have the camera in the air and it's taking pictures. And so you can see this. So this is what we use to make the digital digital surface model, but we also use it to make this very nice photo mosaic of the the rupture in 2012. So 20-year-old earthquake rupture. So let's just zoom in to see. You can still see there it's a kind of a place for geotourism, so a lot of you know people walking and checking it, but some places are still protected. So you see we did this early in the morning. So there's some shadows. So there's the, you know, the line from my balloon. But here you see the fault scar very clearly cutting the, the landscape. The shot, you know, the sun is on the right there. So this place, watch here. Let me stop. Okay. So this was geomorphically what I was interested in is these, these valleys before the earthquake were very flat. But after the earthquake, we lift it up. We make these little nick points. We, we lift up the scarp. And so the drainages, as they respond, they cut in very narrow channels. And they're eroding. So this is post-earthquake erosion. As these small valleys respond to the down drop and the drop in the base level of the channel. And so these are these nick points that are migrating headward. Okay, so here's our site. So just watch here in a moment. I'll turn the right, watch my hand. Okay, it's going left. I'm going to turn this off. That's Google Earth. And then turn it back on. So you see, it's worth doing because it's better than Google Earth, right? So then I'll just looking more at the geomorphology, some erosion in this channel also. You see the person down there. So there I turn the, it off again. So that was Google Earth. The story more. Here's the, the this is 2008 with the terrestrial laser scanner, and it's, uh, where we see the system. Here's the guys. So here you see just some of the equipment. There's the TLS. So this is the uh, the Regal scanner. So these are the seem like quite good ones. You see all the equipment that's required, and then this guy he has a. a GPS on. So we use the GPS and the terrestrial laser scanner because the TLS doesn't have absolute location. It just has the laser points. So you need to GPS the control for the terrestrial laser scanner network. So he's using that, that differential GPS. So here was some work we showed. Uh, this, this map shows the terrestrial laser scanner, but it's, it's the hill shape. But the color is shot per square meter. So you can see most places it was le around one. So we were just surveying, but not so dense. But then some of these places where these channels cross the fault that we were interested in studying, they, we surveyed very detailed. So you see almost 40,000 shots per square meter in some places. And here is uh, this gully here, this one, this place showing the the erosion there, and I don't know if you remember, but I showed this from that 2012 balloon photo, and these these nick points have cut headward significantly since 
1998. So we've been studying the geomorphology, the geomorphic response to this earthquake. Here's the balloon again. So here's just an example of what you can do. So this shows uh, maybe the best way to start here on the left is the black dots. So this is a map, okay? And the black dots are the TLS, terrestrial laser scanner points. There's about 200,000 points here. So it's disturbing of the topography. But then also in 1993, we surveyed with the survey, the total station. So those are the, the, the red dots. So you see not very many, just a few hundred, but they represent the topography right after the earthquake, but before much erosion. And so then we can make a surface, we can make a like a five centimeter digital surface model from the 93 data and the, 2000, the 2008 data, and subtract them, and we get an erosion map, which is what this is. So you can see that we can show that the erosion was in these little channels that's almost a meter in places. And then the other thing we can do is if you take just the data in this little rectangle and you plot it here, there's another color, which is the light blue. And so that's where uh, the one guy was going with the differential GPS. So he was measuring the channels. And, and he, the problem with the terrestrial laser scanner was hard to shoot down into these narrow channels. They were shadowed too much. So he still had to go with the DGPS in the channel. And... So what he could show is that actually, in detail, the channels were so narrow that we couldn't get any laser scanner points in. So in this cross-section, we take these data and just look at them on the side. We can see the fault scarp here. You see the red dots are mostly high, so that's the original survey. And the TLS shows some erosion, but really it's the base of the channel with the the GPS points that show how deeply it eroded. So these these channels are cutting deep and up the scarp. In this case, uh, almost 10 meters. So that's uh, any questions about about that erosion study? So one final thing we could do, and we'll discuss this uh, later this week, maybe Friday. We do marine terraces and diffusion models, but you can try to. Uh, make a model for how the landscape might erode over time. And so the question was for landers was, well, when was the last earthquake? And so uh, the, the, the statement that people made was, well, it had to be a long time ago because we don't really see very many fault scars from it. So I tried to explore that. So what I, I did was I took the original, the, the right after the earthquake would be this black line here. So this shows the fault scarp about almost 1.5 meters high. And if you take out the 92 vertical displacement, you see the dash line is a pretty straight profile. So there was no prior scarf in there. So then if we use a kind of a standard model for how landscapes might evolve over time and we compute the erosion and deposition, you can see that if it were only 1,000 years, we'd still see a scarf. By the time you get to 10,000 years, you start to remove the scarf. And there's really no sign of it anymore. It's just a little steeper. And so with this calculation, we were able to say, well, it looks like it's probably more than a few thousand years old. It's probably more like 10,000 years to erase these scarps. And so at the same time, then these, these guys, Ruben and C, they did the trench at that little uh, uh, sag pond area, and they came up with 9,000 years ago by radiocarbon dating. So our calculations were consistent that it takes, these earthquakes are uncommon. They're so uncommon that the record of them is removed from the landscape by erosion and deposition. This is a short lecture about landers, just to show the earthquake itself and uh, the kind of mapping and description that was done, and then this idea of studying the modification to the scarps that formed over time. And the reason we want to do that is to maybe look at some of these geomorphic tools for, for landscape evolution. How long do these changes take? But also for paleoseismology, we, we're looking back in time and we're looking at how did the scarf change and how did it vary when we then excavate to expose it.